So Luke, thanks for coming down, man. Thanks for having me. I'm really uh, excited. Of course, of course. I want to start at the very beginning. You grew up in Bristol, is that mm -hmm. what, right? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Bristol, which uh, having sort of spent a lot of time uh, going all over the world and uh, experiencing loads of different places, I I feel really lucky to to come from such a, a unique and vibrant place. And for anyone who has never been, I kind of describe it as it's it's kind of like the Amsterdam of the United Kingdom. I think that's the best way to describe it. Have you cool. been? I've never been. One of my sisters went to school there. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a big college town, right? Yeah, there's there's three, two or three universities, and one of them's pretty good. I went to, actually, I went and spent, I think it was a whole entire month at the uh, Bristol UWE. I don't even remember what I was studying. <laughs> I remember one of them was media studies, and I had been studying before that two years of like performing arts and I think in those two years I think we wrote about four or five essays and I remember going to university and going to a, my very first kind of lecture and everyone's taking notes and I'm like what are we what are we taking notes on here I I, I just you know, I was so out of my depth um but I was doing it at the time in order to sort of like stay in the area and and carry on playing with what was then my my group, which was my school band, uh, which would very soon after that uh, sort of like disperse and go off and do other things, which which led me to uh, meeting Adam and the Struts was formed very quickly after that. That's amazing. Did uh, did you grow up in a, a religious household? I know that I read something where you initially were listening to Christian music growing mm. up. Yeah, my my dad was uh, well. He still is, but back then, when we, we were growing up, me and my brother, and my sister, uh, we would find ourselves like in different parts of the world. Whether it was Australia, quite a few times, America, of course, uh, traveling around with my dad and my mum, and he would sort of go and uh, lead the worship in different churches. And his his whole thing was he he would create a, a, a sermon i guess or uh you'd have like he'd devise a message and then with his own original music mm -hmm. he would use that as part of the the narrative in order to get like a certain point across like most like preachers do so he was quite unique in that way and uh you're right from a very early age a lot of the music that I was absorbing was music that I heard in church uh, or of course my dad's own original stuff mm. as well. But I do remember in my parents' uh, CD collection, they had one of those like <laughs> CD racks, you know, right. when you put it in. So it was a few of my dad's ones in there <clears throat> for my mum because I think she's, she's his biggest fan or was, you know, at least back then. Uh, there was an Eagles greatest hit cd which had no cd in it just the case <laughs> and i think it was uh the artwork was like a, a, a highway going through the desert and i remember being quite intrigued by that like wow this looks really cool with the eagles logo it's very small mm. very top and then there was neil diamond's double disc hot august night live and there was an incredible picture of him in a double denim outfit and he's sort of like this and the, the the picture is fantastic you can't really see his face but i remember thinking like who is this you know and then i didn't put the uh, the actual cd into a cd player for quite some time after that and uh, i did discover neil diamonds through my mum which i still adore now which Super is cool. fantastic yeah i could see where that could be influential and in the way you dress or Oh yeah, I mean on stage, yeah. He's great. I mean, especially as a as a songwriter, I'm I'm always don't get me wrong, I, I really love rock and there are certain bands that I've been you know fanatic about and have just been so heavily invested in them, but I also really become intrigued by actual songwriters, like people who do everything 
predominantly on their own. Someone like Neil Diamond, for instance, does all the lyrics, writes mm. the music, um, the chord structures. And he's written some incredible, incredible songs that was all, has also been amazing hits for other artists as well. Like The Monkees, for instance, mm -hmm. um, among loads of other people. So yeah, love Neil Diamond. What um, what was the first record that you bought? Uh, <laughs> I would go and spend like my pocket money, which was two pounds fifty, uh, on sort of the CD singles, and I would do that almost every week. I'd go down to Woolworths, which was sort of like a it, it, they're not around anymore, but they had all the chart music, and you could buy the CD singles and i think one of the first ones was flat beat by mr ozzo which was like a, a really bizarre uh kind of like club sort of dance song uh which is really interesting <laughs> it's great you should really listen to it it's, uh, it's mr ozzo mr ozzo flat beat it's, it's i've never heard of that it's great it's a really good song to dance to and and i'd sort of make up like routines to it <laughs> and um shortly after that vanessa carlton a thousand miles uh, was was a song that I, I really liked. And then my first ever album that I got was Michael Jackson's Off The Wall. And then after that, I, I had like this very big obsession with everything Michael Jackson. But then also I discovered the Jacksons, mm -hmm. Jackson 5, that were obviously before Off The Wall. And then I really got into everything that was Motown and everything that was on that label. And then of course, you know, reading up more about Michael and his influences, I then discovered James Brown through that as well. So that was my sort of like very early teenage uh, music taste. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Michael Jackson was quite the performer. Yeah. And I singer songwriter. And then it's, yeah, it's strange, isn't it? It's like, I don't think um, it, it, it's such a unique uh, case as, as an individual because there, there, there really hasn't been before or really since, I guess, you know, there's, there's so many years to come for people like Bieber and, and even Miley Cyrus. But even even I'm not sure about Bieber, but Miley, for instance, didn't have like a number one song when she was like nine years old, you know, and then continue to evolve and sort of like reach a, a height of superstardom. You know, I don't think anyone has, has ever been, you know, under that sort of like spotlight, scrutiny praise you know mm -hmm. before or since and um maybe it's just one of those things we might not uh ever experience again as fans of music but yeah i mean you know there's a lot of things that have said about him like, out, outside of the music and whatnot but in terms of like purely on the art it's, it's very hard to discredit someone and of, of his genius and 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 how innovative it was you know mm -hmm. for sure what what got you into rock music? It was sort of like 14, 15 years old. Uh, at the time when I was growing up, the, the biggest thing was that was coming into England from America was the, the whole new metal scene. You had a lot of like the pop punk stuff. And, you know, admittedly, I, 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 I sort of got into it like a bit, but... There was always like this part of me which, you know, I, I guess it was like there, there must be more, you know, mm -hmm. to 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 music that, than this. And um, I, I found it quite strange that a lot of the, the youth culture in the UK at the time were kind of going through like a, the best way to describe it, I always thought was a bit of a, like an identity crisis, you know, this... I'd sort of be at school and, you know, talking to friends and hanging out and whatnot. And, you know, they they all wanted to be and and replicate, you know, Blink-182, Sum 41 and the new metal bands and everything like that, Green Day. And 
and I was like, well, well, why? You know, it's it, I, I, I couldn't get the the American like fascination for for quite some time, and and then suddenly the darkness came on the scene, uh, which really was so different from everything else that was going on, and just before that there was a real great explosion of some great bands that were really sort of like waving uh you know like the, the the british flag for instance and and honing in on something that was very uniquely british about them like the libertines um uh razor light the kooks there was like a, a franz mm -hmm. ferdinand sure. kaiser chiefs there was some really great music coming out there but the darkness was just something just a little bit extra about them of course like you know the way that they dress that like they looked like insane and then the, the the sound as well was something that i had you know only heard echoes of from listening to the radio and you'd hear like a queen song or you'd hear the boys are back in town mm -hmm. um with like those signature like harmonized guitars and whatnot and when the darkness came out it really sort of fascinated me and again like what I had sort of done with discovering Michael. I, I, I then read up more on the darkness. And of course, I knew of Queen, like everyone does, you know, to some sort of degree with the greatest hits, for instance. But it wasn't until discovering the darkness, I then was like, oh, okay, Queen, like, yeah. Do you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an effort to do this properly. And I, uh, I consciously went to a record shop in Bristol, uh, in Stokescroft. I'm not sure if it's there anymore, but I looked up the Queen albums and of course there were so many and I was like, wow, okay. So I, I kind of worked it out and I brought the very first one. I brought their debut record and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go home and, and soak this in. And I was just like obsessed, like floored. Blind. It was like, keep self alive, track one on that record and that was it. I was kind of instantly hooked. There was this, there was this kind of like avant-garde, uh, baroque kind of like rock element, and of course it's like proggy as well in certain places with tracks like "Liar" and 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 songs like that. And again, sonically, it didn't sound like anything I'd heard before, and there was just such a a world within it that mm -hmm. I just stepped into. And then I, <laughs> I spent a long time there in that world, um, going from one record to the next. And again, with Queen, I, I then, you know, got heavily into Zeppelin, Hendrix, and would later go on to adore bands like ACDC, especially in the Bond years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah, just sort of the doors as well. It just soaked it all in and just sort of lived in it for the next 10 or so years, you know? Yeah, I, first of all, I, I love the darkness as well. Um, first record was awesome. Seeing them live was awesome. Yeah. Um, and to me, the second record was insane. Yeah. You know, it was produced by Roy Thomas Baker, I think. Yeah, it was. And, uh, it was just sick. Um, Queen, obviously, you know, it's, they're amazing. Did you see the Queen movie? I did, yeah. Um, I, for, for the most part, I, I did really enjoy it. And there was, it's, it's pretty crazy. There, there was this very short moment in time where, it's funny when I look back on it now, but when would this have been? Probably like 2018. And it was when Brian Singer, um, it was just before he got appointed uh, to, to direct the movie. And my good friend Jonas Ackland, who had done the video for Could Have Been Me, he knew of a director, uh, apparently, that was working on the film and had seen the script <clears throat> and had spoken about the project to Jonas. And... Jonas, having worked with me before, uh, not long before that, had said to him, like, look, you, you really need to meet this Luke guy. Like, 
I think he could be absolutely perfect for it because as, as far as I'm aware, I think, and this is just from what I heard, uh, the, the original concept was going to be a little bit more like Rocket Man. I don't know if you saw that I one. I saw both of them for sure. So Rocket Man, as you knew, the the lead actor actually sung a lot of the original music and they sort of like rescored it all and everything. And apparently that's what Bohemian Rhapsody was sort of going towards at one point. So Jonas got in contact with me and was like, you know, I think you'd be perfect. I, I can't think of anyone else who could pull off at least the singing part. The acting, I, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. Um, but I did do two years of performing arts at South Devon College. But I, I was just sort of like up for the opportunity. And I think there was about two months where I was reading up on everything and there was a camera test that was uh, being put in the diary. And all of a sudden, after lots of conversations and backs and back and forth, it just went a little bit quiet. And I was like, oh, okay, what's going on? So I, I talked to my manager and then he called me back a couple of days later and he said, you know, I'm really sorry, but the, I think it was the, the band itself have decided to to go with a different director, which would end up being Brian Singer, I believe. And he had pretty much brought Rami um, mm -hmm. on into the camp and into discussion. And, and I think that's, you know, obviously what happened. But um, looking back now, I'm. it's funny, like in life, sometimes when you think you really, really want something and... You know, it really, you know, it, it knocks you, knocks you down when something like that doesn't come to fruition. But looking back, I'm kind of really happy, not only because I think the movie turned out great and it obviously introduced an entire new generation of kids uh, to discover Queen, because I think that's the best part of the film in itself, because... As a big Queen fan, I, you, you can look at the, um, the the timeline and some of the things like mm. don't quite add up and whatnot. But what it does do is it showcases the music, which is one of the most important parts of the narrative. And they did a great job. And Rami, I thought, was fantastic. And um, and you know, I, if if it had happened, I would have just been. There would there would have been a big sort of there's a big chance I would have just been the guy who played Freddie Mercury mm -hmm. who's in a band and you know the movie was so big you know I mean I'm looking back I probably don't think it would have been the right thing for me to do and but ultimately you actually played with the band in real life at Wembley yeah which is amazing it, yeah it just I, had, how did that feel honestly it was a really bittersweet experience because the circumstances in which I had been, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd been brought there in the first place were just really like heartbreaking. And you're sort of going through these mixed emotions of like, gosh, like I'm here because my good friend like is, is no longer with us. And you're kind of, it's really, it's it's really unique uh and it's it's something that i wouldn't want to experience again for obvious reasons but it's definitely a a really bit weird trip when you you're in wembley stadium and it's sold out and there's like 80,000 plus and i'm getting the opportunity to front this super group of foo fighters mixed with you know Brian and and Roger from Queen doing a Queen song and it's just like incredible it was possibly the greatest experience i've 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 had in my lifetime mixed with one of the most saddest at the same time so it is wow. very strange really weird um but a beautiful day so so happy to have been part of it and, and just honored to have been asked as well. I mean, I had a few moments where on the actual day, just sitting and listening to everyone that was appearing and there were so many 
legit like heavyweight legacy uh artists and and from from bands and and acts that have been going for years and years and years and i'm i'm thinking like i had a little <laughs> bit of imposter syndrome i'm sort of like there going you know Nile rogers and liam gallagher opened <laughs> up the concert for god's sake you know and then there's there's just one amazing person after the next and then you know brian johnson and uh from acdc he's like singing and you know justin from the darkness is is playing and so many of my heroes were there that day and little old me is is on it like 8 30 at night you know just before the foos do their set um which was incredible and yeah i was sort of thinking bloody hell like, it's really important today that you do not suck <laughs> you know like well i mean the stepping into freddie mercury's shoes too is going to be a trap yeah i mean it was i didn't really see it like like that per se i just thought i it was it was i was just sort of realizing like a, a bit of a, a childhood fantasy not even a dream because like a a dream is something that you think you can sort of like obtain at some point if mm -hmm. you you know work hard enough but a fantasy is literally you know being like a 16 year old uh teenager listening to, to queen records in front of the mirror and sort of like pretending you know that you would be playing with with those people so that was purely fantasy becoming reality and um i i, I don't really get nervous at all like we we've even the struts we've we've opened for the stones uh quite a few times Guns and Roses obviously went on tour with the Foo Fighters for the best part of the year. Supported the Who in Quebec, like massive, massive crowds, similar sort of sizes mm -hmm. as well. But just the what was at stake at that gig was just, you know, it, it, I was a little bit overwhelmed, just slightly, and and I definitely, I definitely uh, ordered a bottle of tequila to to my dressing room and and. I think I drank almost half of it by the time I got on stage, <laughs> like before going on. And yeah, I was I was pretty loose by the time we got up. But I I'm I'm I was really happy with with how I did. And it's funny, even now it was it was such a big event. I can lie in bed and actually fantasize like me falling over or like forgetting the words and I'm in bed like Ugh, oh. <laughs> it's like it's still so fresh in my mind you know but such an incredible experience um you said that a lot of your heroes were at the concert were there anybody that you had not met that you were like taken back by yeah i so, so we all stayed at this beautiful hotel for for about a week before the actual uh show itself so Everyone who had come over from the United States uh, was was staying there, and uh, I, I struck up a great connection and friendship with Jason Faulkner, who plays with with Beck, Saint Vincent. Uh, he played in Jellyfish he played as well, in Jellyfish, yeah. and we just hit it off, and we were sat next to each other on the plane, and and we just had a, a great laugh and we're just drinking and just talking music nonstop, you know, the whole way. <laughs> and then <clears throat> that carried on and he kind of looks a bit like John Bon Jovi <laughs> when you look at him. And I was always, we, we would, we would go out to eat and dinner and the waitress would come over and take our order and, uh, he'd get to Jason. I was like, excuse me, do you know who this is? And he's like, Luke, stop, stop. I'm like, it's, jo it's Bon Jovi. And she'd be like, oh my God. And they, they, they'd like believe it for a second. Uh, so I, I still I still hang out with him and we've been working with each other on some music as well, which has been really fun. Josh Holm from mm -hmm. Queens of the Stone Age had a great couple of nights with him and he's just the absolute sweetest bloke ever. Yeah you know and it was uh i think visually we we make quite the pair you know i'm just like this small little like english guy and there's this huge like massive burly like american guy and and he's tall right he's how, massive how how tall is he oh i mean i'm not very tall i'm probably like what five eight maybe five nine and he towers over me so he he's 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 up there 
he's wow. up there. I've never met him. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. And um, he, you know, like everyone who was involved um, in that tribute show, they're all just still such fans of music and and each other. And it was it was so beautiful to to sort of have so many great conversations with everyone and and just talk life and talk art and and music and yeah really really incredible experience that's awesome um were you a jellyfish were you aware of jellyfish before you met jason i i was aware of them yeah i hadn't listened to a lot of their their music uh per se a lot of people would would turn around and say you've got to listen to them. Oh, you know? I mean, if amazing. you love, yeah, amazing. if you love this kind of like the seventies glam mm -hmm. of the UK and and a little bit of prog, you'd really, really love it. Um, so I, I've listened to uh, songs since, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like really great stuff. Yeah, Incredible very stuff. underrated. I mean, I mean, critics loved it. I'm sure, but yeah, um, yeah, really amazing band. Um. So, you have a new record coming out. Mm -hmm. Coming Tell me out a little bit about that. Uh, it's the Struts' fourth record, entitled "Pretty Vicious," and it has eleven songs, um, which were sort of accumulated with like a variety of a lot of brand new songs that we'd sort of conjured up and some that we had done in 2019, like mm -hmm. just before the pandemic. And uh, we also decided to sort of like really dig deep um, with, with a couple of songs that made the record, which for whatever reason, every, every band and every artist has them. Like the, these these ideas that, never sort of surface because something just isn't quite right it's mm -hmm. just not quite good enough and luckily for whatever reason we we got to a point where it was about a month before we went into the studio in nashville to start tracking and we already had a whole bunch of demos probably about 40 plus that we had accumulated over two years including um a couple of sessions in 2019 and Rockstar, for instance, uh, which was the latest thing that, that we put out leading up to the, the release of the album, was a song that we we were playing live like 10 years ago, but it just wasn't quite right. And, you know, we very quickly like dropped it and, and shelved it. But we decided, me, myself, uh, myself and Ads, sorry, uh, decided to, <laughs> me, myself and Ads, <laughs> decided to to sort of revisit it and we sort of analysed it and was just like, you know, what what is it about this track that just hasn't quite made the cut and ended up rewriting the lyric, which made like a huge difference. You know, the, the original concept was uh a bit of an immature kind of like pointing the finger at like oh you think you're a rock star you don't know who you are it was kind of mm -hmm. it was quite negative you know and i was like why we don't we shouldn't really be doing that let's make it um about uh like a girl that you meet and she's like amazing and she has like rock star energy just way more fun and digestible and and the rewrite just made the song way stronger and we we addressed um some of the issues with the arrangement and it just it absolutely just slams it was i think that was the second take that we did and it was just furious like gethin's drumming in in that song in particular is is some some of the best on the record and same thing happened with the song called i won't run as well it was a song that we just couldn't quite get mm -hmm. right and scott borchetta the, the head of Big Machine was sat uh, in the studio while we were tracking that song and made some amazing suggestions, which turned it into like this Bruce Springsteen meets Foo Fighters peppered with like a little bit of Queen. So it turned out to be a really, really great song. That's awesome. I think the zeitgeist has been 
all about this idea that everybody can be a rock star. Mm. And you don't have to be a music rock star, but you could be a rock star in your own space. And I think that's why how you you rearrange it, it seems like that's that really makes sense with the current zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah, totally. Especially, especially now, I think we've we've all noticed there's been a really big resurgence in. I don't know. It's very corny to use these terms, but like this this rock and roll flavor, if you want to call it that. And to be honest, there was a point. Uh, when we were making this record that I was really pushing to do something very different than we'd ever done before. And and we did push in that direction for quite some time. And quite a few people really kind of came up to me and they were like, look, Luke, like, this is kind of like the moment that the struts have been waiting for. And I was like, well, what do you mean? It was like, you know, when you came out, mm -hmm uh 2015 and you you put out like the, the the debut record it was probably the worst time to have been in a in a band there was really no groups uh out there that were really sort of like exciting visually or sonically and i was sort of <laughs> reminded that you know things had finally suddenly started to come round full circle with groups that had just been exploding like Greta Van Fleet and of course Maniskin uh, during the pandemic for instance and you know everyone just sort of said just, just, just sort of like think mm -hmm. on that you know and I was like okay well that's true uh, maybe we should sort of come in and approach this fourth record in a way which was sort of like let's show everyone what we can really do in this genre and hopefully our experience uh, and everything that we've learned in the last 12 plus years people will be able to hear that in this mm -hmm. record and i i don't want to sort of say it, it was kind of like a, a final swing of the bat so to speak but there was a bit of uh, this thing in the air between all, all members of, of the group that we were like, I think it's, this has to be our time. It's, it's, it's now or never, you mm -hmm. know, because of the musical climate and the circumstances. So we were like, let's go in and make the best rock record that the Struts have ever done and the best rock record that anyone's going to hear this year and you know maybe even more if um if it goes well but that was literally the goal and to be honest i think when people hear it they'll sort of agree it is it's the it's the record that a lot of our peers a lot of our fans uh and a lot of our contemporaries have been waiting for us to make it has the best elements of the group where it has like some absolute raw power and sounds the closest to us live than any record that we've done but then it also has we allowed ourselves the time to write and write and write and write and accumulate the best songs that we possibly could so we really absolutely gave this record 100 percent and more and i think people will hear that that's amazing well adam is an amazing guitar player yeah He's really good. I mean, even that, you know, I mean, no, none of the group will really mind when I say this, but for instance, when the Struts formed with, with the, the lineup that, you know, we have now, uh, it, about 10 years ago, the band, you know, the three of them were, were quite different kind of players. You know, they, they were still really... Uh, finding like their their signature sort of like feels and their own techniques and again like they won't mind me saying this <laughs> but you know I I was sort of like ready to go straight out straight out of the gate and um, I, I I haven't really changed an awful lot uh, when it comes to sort of like my vocal technique or the way that I perform and 
I think now is it's like the best that the group's ever been. And Adam, for instance, you know, in the last three, four years, especially, I've sort of seen him go from quite like a, at times quite shy, uh, like performer who questioned his own ability and, and whatnot. And I've seen him become, you know, li a, a literal sort of guitar hero, mm -hmm. you know, in the last three to four years. And same with Jed and, and Gethin, like in terms of a rhythm section, like they're so tight. And that is just from purely getting out there and playing and playing and playing, touring constantly and writing a lot and experiencing uh some valuable lessons in and out the studio and yeah i think Is we're the, a better band did the rest of the band move to la as well or yeah so initially i mean funnily enough going back to taylor hawkins it was i was it was 2019 and we'd always consider ourselves to be like a british group mm -hmm. and we liked to go back home at the time when we weren't touring which was a lot and uh, Taylor invited me to uh, a Thanksgiving celebration at his place and he sort of like you know took me to one side and, and he really encouraged me to to make the move to LA and, and just explained he was like man like you know we we could sort of like be playing together and there are so many people here that you should be meeting and you've got to get into the thick of it you know while you're sort of like at the age that you are and, and I sort of went home and I really agreed and I ended up uh renting a room from uh Brent Woods which is a great friend of Taylor's who played in Chevy Metal with him for years and I remember I we had a a band meeting at the Rainbow and <laughs> <laughs> as you do as you do and uh, that was like our, our usual stomping ground back then and I just I just said to everyone like look guys I've been really thinking about it and I'm gonna make the move and I have a room like ready to go and I'm gonna be moving early next year and everyone was sort of like wow okay um, right and then shortly after that a couple of weeks went by and then you know one by one they were like wow well, you know we we've got to go as well and it it was one of the best things that happened to us um, Jed's recently got married to. An American lady and Gethin and Ads uh, live with um, Adam's girlfriend Kelsey Carter, and they're always doing stuff. And I've managed to get into the studio with other artists that, apart from the Struts, and work outside of the band, which has been really great. I, I had a song with Grandson mm -hmm. on his last record, and yeah, it's just been it's it's been a really great place to actually get work done and you know granted it took me took me a minute to sort of uh not get sucked in too much with the the party lifestyle which is so ready and available to anyone who, who comes here especially when you're not from here right you get here and you're like wow like there's something to do every night and before you know it you you're out you know six days a week and partying and doing stuff but i i sort of like nip that in the bud and 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 now I sort of uh, use it to to my advantage and 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 really get a lot of work done when I'm not on on the road. Did you ever move to London or just come straight to LA? We located to Derby before uh, we we got picked up by Interscope in the US, and we were there for I think it was like two to three years, I think, um, which was an experience i mean adam obviously is from derby so where is derby derby <laughs> derby <laughs> is basically slap bang in the middle of the uk so it's above birmingham mm -hmm. you can drive to london in about under two hours if that and one of the biggest reasons why we were encouraged to move there by our previous management was simply because it was it was cheaper than london and you were so close to so many of the major cities, we could save lots of money 
by driving up to Manchester and then driving back that mm -hmm. night and getting back home at like three or four a.m. and save money on hotels and things like that. And it, you know, to be honest, it was a good move at the time. Um, but you know, no offense to anyone who is from Derby and love and loves it, but it's not, it's not a, a very inspiring place and um it was different members sort of uh took to it in in their own ways and um especially coming from somewhere like bristol you know which is mm -hmm. really vibrant and has a great music scene you know there really wasn't anything going on in derby um a little bit now but not as much but we had some great times there and but we were all happy to kind of like you know leave sure. and, and go to the the next stage of, of our career you mentioned that you're working on a solo record right now i am yes can you can you talk a little bit about that uh well what happened was during uh the sort of like the, the last waves of the pandemic i was living in the uk uh with my parents actually and then this place down the road came up for, for rent. So I quickly moved into that place <laughs> so I could have a bit of independence, which was really great. And uh, very quickly got like a piano and it was before the pubs and all of that had opened up and you could go to the beer gardens. So I would just sort of find myself on my own and, and writing a lot by the piano. And then I suddenly just had this idea of like wow like i'm writing these songs all by myself with no one else involved and you know they're really speaking to me and they're really honest and very quickly i started to sort of create this vision of a record that was based purely on my own experiences of love sex and heartbreak and that was it i was like just so inspired and then it, just one song after the next just started coming and I didn't really know like what would come of them mm -hmm. um and then very quickly the, you know everything opened back up again I just sort of like had them on my phone these little ideas and I lived with them for quite some time and then came back to America and we ended up signing a new record deal with Big Machine and I wanted to say something, but there was a, a big part of me which was like, look, you know, these ideas aren't getting, going anywhere. Um, you know, the struts, the main reason why you're here really sort of needs my 100% focus and attention. So I just sort of said to myself, okay, I'm going to throw absolutely everything that I have, not spare any uh, of my inspiration or ideas or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm not going to keep anything to one side. I'm going to give this Struts record everything that I have. And then when the time is right, I'll sort of approach everyone and just sort of say like, look, I, I have this idea mm -hmm. and I just, I'd love to see it through. And I was really heavily inspired last year doing the shows of Mike Garson, for instance, where predominantly it was very much me and him. Uh, so vocals and piano. And I even did a couple of these solo songs in those sets. And I was like, wow, I could really do this. And not only that, but I could reach someone in the audience and really make them feel something without this this band, this big band and these loud guitars and big production kind of thing. So I I finished the Struts record and... And then I ended up talking to to Scott and I just I just said to him, I said, look, you know, just to be clear, this isn't me sort of like, you know, I, I don't have my priorities mixed up for mm -hmm. one. Like the struts is my baby. It's it's such a huge part of my life and my world. But I have these ideas and these songs in me that I know aren't right for the band and I have such a clear vision on how they should sound and how they should be presented. I'm asking you to, to give me the chance to do these 
then get them out my head and get them off my chest so I can actually go on and, and carry on being productive with the band. Because sometimes when you've got all of this sitting here, it's hard to kind of separate the two projects uh, in the beginning anyway. Um, so I, I realized very quickly I had to do something about it. Otherwise, I wasn't going to be able to to move on, mm -hmm. you know. And Scott was really gracious and was like, look, let's let's talk. Let me hear some music. And he was absolutely blown away. And um, he, he completely understood it and got it because it's very different from the struts. It's 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 not a rock like record um per se of course it has like mm -hmm. rock moments in it but for the most part uh my absolute goal was to create songs that would really like touch people to the core met with lyrics that people could just sort of like get lost in and i had this very clear vision of just great piano driven songs with huge orchestration and create this world which is a mixture of scott walker and lana del rey a mm. bit of like adele um sort of like mixed into one and i just thought if that could be my sort of brief i, I think it would create a really interesting album so sounds awesome i can't yeah, wait to hear it it's great is uh are you going to do that through Big Machine as well? Yeah, yeah, I will be. I will cool. be. I'm not sure at this moment in time when mm -hmm. some of these things will be surfacing, but uh, I've, I'm already pushing the label to get the struts back in the studio in January. <laughs> 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 so I'm not sure when when <laughs> this Luke's Villa record is going to surface, uh, but I've there there are as of today, there's about nine or ten songs which have been pretty much completed. And then after this uh, this beautiful encounter we're having right now, I'm going to be heading back to the studio and working on some more songs. Solo or struts? Solo. Nice, nice. Is Mike Garson play on your record? He isn't actually, no. I'm working with uh, John Levine, who I've known through the struts projects for years now. Uh, we did, I think one of the first things we did was Body Talks and a few songs from the second record and then he co-wrote and produced the, our lockdown record that we did in seven days which again was another inspiring experience that i knew that me and john have this really great creative chemistry and then shortly after that i then took him a few ideas uh, that i had and we worked on them together and we're like, wow, this is so cool. Like we didn't even know like what would come of it or anything, but some of those tracks are, are making uh, my debut solo record. So it's really exciting. That's amazing. Congrats on that. Thank you. Are you about to go out on tour to tour the new record? Yeah, we're heading out at the start of November and then a few weeks before that, we're going to be appearing on Good Morning America as well. Amazing. Which is great. So we're going to be pushing the next single that's going to radio, which is going to be pretty vicious, uh, which I'm really excited about. And hence why <clears throat> hence why I, I really wanted to call the record Pretty Vicious, because not well, not only is it a really like cool and edgy name, objectively, in my opinion. <laughs> no, it is a cool um, and edgy name. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it was cool. You know, I mean, there were a lot of names floating ab around uh you know for instance like remember the name of the struts you know and all this kind of stuff but i just thought we need to do something different you know me i i still despite it being an all-out rock record i still had this um urge to sort of like do something that we hadn't quite done before and pretty vicious was created within that mindset and what i love about it is it's it's not trying to be like an anthem you know, I mean, there have been many times, which which all groups and artists do, where you end up ripping yourself off from time to time, consciously and subconsciously. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it came to Pretty Vicious, I was like, wow, this is this is so strong. It's as strong as some of our our, our biggest singles, but in its own unique way. And I thought this is really unique. We have to 
highlight this song. And I was so happy that once we submitted the album that the label felt the same and they were like, no, this one's really, really cool. It's, it's brilliant. It's dark. It's sexy. It's edgy. You can actually dance to it as well, which is always a plus. And, yeah. um, yeah, so we're going to be pushing that one along with the album release. Of course, I, hopefully we'll be doing some other like appearances on TV and whatnot after good morning America, but I'm really excited. It's going to be a brilliant tour. We always love touring the United States. I mean, we just got back from a tour that was the UK and Europe and love doing Europe and the United Kingdom. Don't get me wrong, but it it does become a bit of like a logistical nightmare at times, especially when you're doing like fly dates where you're waking up at 5 a.m. to get to the airport and checking like 36 check bags which are included with your clothes and equipment and it takes two hours to check in and it's just an absolute nightmare but the shows were always um really good but it's going to be nice just getting on a bus you know on in america where it's sort of like you can really get into like a nice routine and look after yourself and everything's pretty much the same every day and the venues are going to be great and we're actually finishing the tour in LA, I believe, which is going to be a really, really great show. Well, where are you going to play in LA? I I believe it is the Wilton, I believe. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't really tend to look at the dates too much because, one, because it, it can be a bit overwhelming for a singer mm -hmm. as well. I see them, I'm like, God, there's four in a row here and then we got just one day off and there's three in a row and I'm like, Whoa. If I think about it too much, I sort of like get in my own head. But if I just sort of approach this tour like just one day at a time and just get through it and look after myself, then that's usually how uh, how it gets done. And uh, it's going to be interesting because normally those last weeks on a run like that, you're normally pretty gassed out and having such a an important show as the last one is going to be a first for us so we uh we're literally just going to have to keep steamrolling through until until the bitter end and do you and know the, when the date is it is i believe it's the 11th of december or the 10th i believe it's, it's the coming 11th. up soon yeah and are you booked into 2024 if you looked at we're doing a yet? not not as of yet we're still sort of like waiting to sort of like see obviously that there, there's like discussions happening at the moment but um for instance i was talking to josh i texted him and i and asked him you know queen's going out like next year like you know we should do some stuff totally. and he was like yeah like that'd be amazing so that might be a possibility uh we're doing this rock cruise which should be quite fun what is that it's like uh it it, it, it takes off from takes off what sets sail <laughs> from uh miami uh in mid late uh january and then you just basically you play three sets over like a five day period and there's a whole bunch of other bands and artists um who, else, all, who else is playing like uh, really it's quite a random line you got katie tunstall yeah. uh bowling for soup um Gosh, who else? Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to get any names wrong, but I, I believe like the Lumineers as well. Oh, cool! I can't remember, but there's. I haven't again. I haven't really <laughs> looked at it too much, but it's a really like widespread eclectic uh, uh, collection of, of of artists and bands, and um, it's just always fun. We did one years ago for for Kid Rock, which was <laughs> which was an experience. <laughs> Uh, and that was just a non-stop party for an entire week. So I don't think this one's going to be any different, you know. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be good. But in terms of what exactly we're doing throughout the rest of next year, I think a lot of it depends on how the the next record does. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much um, for coming down. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. This was awesome. <laughs> 